we were using a local kind of config. And now you have fantastic tools like Minikube, Docker for Mac, Docker for um, Windows, MicroKates from the Ubuntu uh, Canonical folks. If you're Greenfield and you've only got a couple of services, nothing wrong with spinning up a Minikube locally and putting all your stuff there. And you can work locally and talk very quickly to the Minikube cluster on your laptops, everything local. But as a Java developer, as much as I, I love my Java, I'm, so, I'm quick to realize that Java is quite resource heavy, both in terms of like, you know, a minimum Docker container is pretty much 100 megs, and the resources required to run a heap-based system like JVM often sucks up a lot of, uh, of RAM and so forth. Uh, even though I've got a 16 gig uh, uh, laptop, running Kubernetes, a Minikube, and a couple of JVMs, and a database soon exhausts this laptop. I've totally got my eye on the new 16-inch Macs with the 64-gig uh, core. I just got to convince the team to buy me a new Mac. <laughs> new Mac. But this is the reality. Is as the system grows more complex, you know, physically, you cannot fit it on a single machine. The answer, or one answer, is telepresence. Yeah. This is the logo. Uh, please do not say it's a penguin. Uh, often folks say it's a penguin. It's a blackbird. <laughs> this is the logo you'll see around. Uh, it's, it's a CNCF-hosted project. Um, I'll, I'll do a bit of a deeper dive into what it is, um, it is now. And uh, what we often see folks saying, folks bump into it when they're, um, they're searching for you know, debug tools on Kubernetes, and these are the kind of common things we hear. It's a fancy Kubernetes VPN for development. So if you're used to using a VPN like your local laptop into a corporate network, just think that corporate network as a Kubernetes cluster, same kind of deal. You're VPNing into that cluster as you would a network. If anyone's used um, kubectl or kubectl, port forward, um, I often use that to access dashboards running in clusters. It's very similar to that, but it's a two-way and it's a much more powerful um, sort of paradigm behind it. It is fundamentally a network bridge between your laptop and the Kubernetes clusters. Hopefully one of those models works for you as to what telepresence is. Does that fundamentally make sense? Two-way proxy in the cluster, traffic going backwards and forwards, apps running in the cluster, I can run stuff locally, and traffic comes into my laptop as if it was in the cluster and goes back into the cluster. That's fundamentally the model of telepresence. It's not super complicated, but sometimes a demo does make it a lot more obvious. How it works at the moment, it fundamentally replaces a Kubernetes deployment. That comes with strengths and weaknesses. It literally replaces the deployment, the, you know, the containers, with a two-way proxy. I'll show you that in just a moment. You'll see the pods going down, being terminated, new pods coming up with a replacement proxy. I can then run the swapped deployment locally, and the traffic gets forwarded in. I can do some stuff with it, do my fast debugging, little fast coding loop, and traffic will be flowing out. But it literally swaps out a deployment. There are other tools out there that do things, and we're looking at doing some other things with um, proxies, using sort of proxies next to app. But always remember, the telepresence at the moment, you swap out a deployment. So I'll show you some, like, there's a few anti-patterns we've seen where folks are trying to swap out a swapped out deployment. It can get a bit gnarly. It's fundamentally a single user system. You swap out a deployment, anyone poking traffic into that cluster will end up on your laptop. So if your colleague doesn't realize you've swapped out that deployment, they'll be going to your, they'll be using your laptop basically to, to, to test, which is fun sometimes. Uh, you get uh, you intercept DNS, environment variables and secrets, volumes and TCP. It's pretty cool stuff. I often use it to debug gnarly DNS issues. Um, I, you know, I'm, what's going on in the cluster? Telepresence in. I can use dig. I can use NS lookup, figure out what's going on. That's super useful for me. I'll give you a little demo now. And this is the basic architecture. Um, super straightforward. A customer at the top making a request in. I'm, I'm using Ambassador, uh, open source uh, ingress gateway. That forwards the request onto the shop front. It's a very simple e-commerce type thing, like read-only. You'll see my JavaScript, my UX skills are pretty poor. I'm mainly a back-end person. But the shop front then makes a request to two upstream services, product catalog and shop manager, aggregates the data back, and displays it to the user. So the product information coming from product catalog, the stock information, the SKU, the amount we've got in stock coming from the stock manager. Shop front is coordinating that and displaying it back to the user. What we're going to do is swap out the shop front deployment with telepresence, and we're going to watch traffic flow to my laptop and then back into the cluster. And I'll be, I'll be coding on the shop front, but it'll be calling into the product catalog and the stock manager running in the cluster. That's the deal. Or fingers crossed, yeah? Like, a massive respect to Liz yesterday. Like, coding in front of that keynote was just amazing, yeah? Like, this is, this is a small, small amount of, like, a, compared to what Liz did there. Right. 
let's uh, fire up our item here. So if I just do down the bottom here and show you what I've got going on, KubeCloud will get pods, fingers crossed, with the Wi-Fi. You can see I've got four pods. The ambassador is literally the ingress gateway. We're not going to be touching that too much today. It's just helping me get traffic into my cluster. I've got my product catalog pod, my shop front, and my stock manager. Pretty simple stuff, yeah? Let's just watch that because that is going to be uh, interesting as we swap the pods out with telepresence. You'll notice some fun stuff happens there. If I swap to my top terminal there and do, uh, oh, kubectl, get a service. I've got ambassadors a load balancer. Here's my um, IP, my external IP. If I then load into Firefox, excuse the slight movement of uh, code, and if I do there, you can marvel at my UX skills. This is literally the e-commerce the, the e web app, yeah? Uh, you see the um, product information sort of on the right, bottom right, and the um, SKU information, the stock information on, on, the, uh, on the left, I should say. Right. Let me just actually uh, bring that there. Uh, so now what I shall do, um, I'll also show you, so if you imagine like this network namespace of my laptop, I am not in the cluster. So if I just do NS lookup product catalog, oops, oh, this is hard typing. We should get nothing back. Yeah, I'm running locally. The product catalog service means something in the cluster, as does Shopfront, as does Stock Manager, but locally at the moment it means nothing. Yeah. If I now swap out my cheat sheet here, and watch what's going on. So I'm literally now going to run a telepresence command, swap deployment. I'm swapping out the shop front with a proxy, uh, and then it will proxy to my local machine. And have a look at the shop front pod in the bottom of the terminal there. I want to do this, fingers crossed. You do have to be rooted to run telepresence because it does do some interesting networking bits and pieces. You can see the shop front pod is terminating and it's being replaced by that proxy. Yeah? And fingers crossed, if the Wi-Fi holds up, when telepresence comes back, boom, looks good. The command I talked about earlier, the NS lookup, for example, if I do now product catalog, it comes back with data. The net, we're sharing the network namespace now. So I can literally, for example, um, do a curl so of the downstream service. Uh, it's running on 8020, uh, I think, slash products. I, I, I can literally curl upstream services. So I'm, like, now I'm literally calling out to the products catalog service in the cluster, yeah, which is quite nice. And when I'm coding, my uh, app I'm coding can be doing the same thing. I can be talking to all these upstream services. Where it gets super interesting, let me just check my cheat sheet um, on here. Uh, is with the um, Shopfront website, right. So now I've swapped my um, Shopfront out for a two-way proxy. What do people think is going to happen if I hit refresh now, being that I'm running nothing locally? Any guesses as to what's going to happen? The traffic's coming into the cluster, the proxy's forwarding it to my local machine, nothing's running on my local machine. If I refresh, I'm going to get an error. Yeah, I'm using it as Ambassador and Envoy. I'm, just sort of hiding the error, but basically it's, yeah, 404, there's, there's nothing there. So what I can do instead, if I fire up, I've got IntelliJ running here, it's just a Java IDE, I've loaded in my shop front service, and if I fire this up, I'll use the debug mode, because we'll do a little bit of debugging in a minute. Don't worry if it's a bit small, like uh, the main things I can talk through. Now I'm literally firing up the Java app. Down the bottom, you can see I've started, here it just says I'm starting a JVM, I'm listening on port, localhost, uh, port 8010. Now, if I do a refresh on my um, uh, shop front, that traffic is going, like I'm making the request to the Google Cloud where my Kubernetes cluster is running. Ambassador is forwarding it on to the shop front. The shop front proxy is forwarding that traffic to my laptop, and I'm responding via my Java app running here back into the cluster. You'll notice the header is actually red now. I've just changed the CSS. Yeah. This is kind of cool. Yeah, as in, like, you get awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I, when I first saw this, I was like, this is genuinely game changing. This is really awesome, yeah. But the, the cool stuff, and I'm only going to give you a little sneak and peek. Now, Abe is going to do a much better demo later on. He's going to walk through several examples with Python and Java and a, and a few other things as well. But because we are running in debug mode, if I um, swap out to my browser and refresh, 
it will hit the debug. Yeah, so I've got full debugger here. I'm running this locally. I can inspect things. I can literally just pass it through, for example, and my page is rendered. Uh, as a little example of actually like, uh, uh, doing something a bit more interesting, for example, I can do the refresh. I've set quite a loose timeout on our Ambassador. So as, I'm, as it's waiting there for the response, I can basically change out the widget here to KubeCon widget. Fingers crossed that works. Looks good. If I now uh, pass that through, fingers crossed, there we have KubeCon widget. Yeah? So I can literally, you know, I don't have to be debugging, I can just literally be coding away. But I often find myself, when something is going a bit gnarly with a bunch of services aggregating data, I can step through the data. Long as my ingress has got a long timeout, so I don't actually time out at the ingress point, I can step through my data, figure out what's going on, return the traffic, and kind of close that dev loop. So this is like super useful. A quick look at the cheat sheet. I think that is pretty much it. Yeah, now if I just uh, tidy up everything here, uh, basically as soon as you exit, Look at the pod in the bottom there. You'll notice my shop front with the UID being terminated and the shop front, a new shop front pod is being spun up. It'll take a minute or two to start because it's a Java app, but fundamentally now it's just back to, back to normal. So that's the, the demo part. I'll just switch back to that. I, I do find the demo makes a big difference of kind of explaining some of the mechanics. So hopefully that was useful for you. If you do want more of a demo, myself, Rafi, Abe, uh, pop by the booth. We can run you through some more stuff. You can access volumes. You can do all, all manner of cool things with it. Oh, that's my, if it didn't work. I've, I've, been too, I've been burned too many times by conference Wi-Fi. Let me just uh, do that. Yeah, benefits. Like you can run any tool. Uh, on your laptop that you, you normally do. Traffic's coming in, you can analyze that traffic, you can use an IDE, a profiler, debugger, awesome stuff. From local, you can connect to most cloud resources. There's a few nuances depending on the mode you run telepresence in, but I've not found it a big issue. I'm accessing like RDS databases in the cloud or as long as they're mapped from my Kubernetes cluster, accessing upstream services like you, like you saw, and we are in the same network namespace. So you can dig, you can NS look up, love it. You saw, saw hopefully sort of an inspiration for how you can get this very fast debug loop. I can be debugging, I can be coding, and as long as I'm making requests against the ingress, and it's sort of being passed through, I can play around with the actual data. Now clearly, in comparison to say something like Minikube, you do need a network connection for this. So I live in the UK, like my, my journey into London is like the Wi-Fi is super sketchy on the trains, this can be a bit hard with telepresence. Sometimes I do de local debugging there with like Minikube, that's fine, but you do need a network connection to do this kind of thing. You do also need kubectl access. We use kubectl to bootstrap telepresence, so depending on your uh, administrators, they might lock some of these things down, so just be aware of that. And at the moment, it really only supports, uh, only runs on Mac and Linux, unless you've got like WSL2, the Windows subsystem for Linux, and that, uh, that's just uh, some caveats to be aware of. Mentioned before, is it is a CNCF project? There's a bunch of users. Every KubeCon we come to, we hear about more folks. Uh, randomly, like I was going down to breakfast in the elevator the other day, and someone said, like, "Oh, Telepresence Ambassador, we use that." I'm like, "Where do you work?" And I'd never heard of the company, but how cool was that? Yeah, there are these kind of tools out there. Really, uh, and please, if you do use Telepresence, let us know. We'd love to, if, you, if you're allowed to, love to use your logo. Love to talk about case studies. I've learned a bunch from folks like yourselves over the years on really interesting ways of using Telepresence, which I hadn't first thought of. So that was, I always love coming to KubeCon for that reason. Now, one thing, I love the Hacker News crowd. Yeah, I'm on Hacker News a little bit myself. I'm on Reddit a little bit. But there is a lot of this, why is Uber, you know, why is Uber so big? I could build Uber in the weekend, yeah? I could build Lyft in the weekend, you know? I could build Oracle in the weekend or whatever. And, you know, I'm, oh, when I see this, and we do get this a little bit with telepresence, yeah? Why is telepresence so complicated? Surely I could just, just spin up a two-way proxy, you know, I could do that in a weekend, yeah? And, yeah. Maybe you could, but Rafi and I were having an interesting chat yesterday. The gnarly stuff is getting it working for everyone. It's really easy to get something working for you, but getting something working for your colleague who's got slightly different firewall settings, slightly different networking settings. Then getting it working for Linux, Linux, Mac. It, like, kudos to Abe, like, does a fantastic job, and, and Rafi and the whole team and all the contributors. Like, there is a lot of gnarly stuff with DSS, with Intercept, all these things. My thing is, you know, why reinvent this when there's a project already out there that does it? I, I, I highly recommend looking at telepresence before trying to build your own. So using this in your workflow. The kind of YOLO workflow, I like to say, is when you've, got, you've not got product market fit, you're literally you know, maybe an individual developer, you're starting up with a business idea, you're running Kubernetes, bunch of microservices, you can literally connect into production. 
Yeah, if you're getting a little bit of traffic, it's all coming to your laptop. You can do some, funny, uh, some fun with if statements, for example. And you can pass through some traffic. And the traffic that you're interested in, you, know, you can start playing around with, for example. Um, super simple kind of thing. Um, once your code is done, like telepresence is not a, sort of a, um, a replacement for something like a pipeline like Jenkins, like Circle CI. It's great for that inner dev loop, but I always deploy my code through a proper pipeline. Yeah, even if I'm de debugging in production here, when the fix is done, you might be testing it with telepresence, but then you push it through your normal pipeline. Security testing, performance testing, all this good stuff. Yeah? Telepresence is not a deployment tool. Uh, it is more a uh, sort of fast feedback, fast debugging type tool that is really, really important. Uh, when I do say to some folks about you know, debugging in production, particularly the manager types, they're often like, Oh, debugging in production, this is not a good look, yeah. Um, so I get it, totally, I get it, you know. Um, with the SMEs, what a lot of folks, pe people this kind of size do is they have multiple clusters, yeah, and they have like a dev cluster, a staging cluster, and people sort of, as long as they coordinate, because like I mentioned, telepresence is a kind of single user thing. If you swap out a deployment, anyone else accessing the cluster will be routed to your, um, your laptop. As long as you coordinate, this scales pretty well, to be honest, yeah? You should check out your microservice, coordinate with the team, telepresence into the dev cluster, do your testing, you know, and shut down telepresence. Again, you wanna be doing as much as you can locally with mocks and with, you know, stubbing and stuff, but when you need telepresence, you coordinate with the team, and then you exit quickly, and someone else can go onto the cluster. Uh, Buddy of mine in London, Cesar, did a fantastic talk at DevOps about this, how he, was, he and his team were using, uh, using telepresence in this kind of fashion. Um, link there for you as well. Uh, more advanced workflow. So I learned a lot from um, Christian at Engel and Vocals uh, at uh, Barcelona this year, KubeCon EU. And they do some really interesting stuff. The video's there. You can pop on to the CNCF website, grab the video. And they were using Bazel, which is um, sort of an offshoot from Google's build tool. And they were integrating it with telepresence. They were running in what's called container mode, which is subtly different than the mode I was showing you. But they had a really nice way of using multiple um, namespaces, pretty much a namespace per developer in a series of clusters. And Christian walked through the kind of workflow, the trade-offs, all this kind of thing. And I learned a bunch from Christian. So I thoroughly recommend if you're trying to scale up your telepresence usage, um, Christian's talk is a really nice kind of way to, to learn some more. Uh, so what's next? So telepresence itself is split between client and kind of server or proxy component. The, you see what the client does there. You can see what the, the proxy um, does there as well. Um, we are looking at sort of, you know, open source project, contributions coming in. We're doing some things behind uh, as well in, in DataWire. And the telepresence client at the moment uh, is using kubectl port forward to bootstrap S-Shuttle, which is a SSH-based VPN. Now, it's a VPN, so it's pretty heavyweight. We don't need all that functionality in there. So we're looking at using something else in the client, something a bit more lightweight. Uh, capture DNS locally, do your you know, DNS resolution intelligently, and redirect comms, but without the full function of a VPN. Uh, it's already in progress, like stay tuned. I think Abe will talk about this more in his session uh, this, this, af uh, this afternoon. Uh, we're doing uh, some announcements at DataWire later in the year, December 10th, so stay tuned for some of that stuff as well. Um, and we're also looking at things like multiple um, simultaneous swaps, which is, is, is very interesting. Um, proxy server, as you saw at the moment, it literally replaces the deployment, replaces the pod. Um, that's not really ideal. You want some kind of persistent mechanism, Kubernetes, is fantastic at persistence in terms of, of, of services. If a node dies, it spins up the pods on another node, which is good. So we're thinking we probably should sort of leverage that model of Kubernetes to have something hanging around in the cluster, which speeds up the connections rather than killing a deployment every time and waiting for it to connect. Yeah, multi-user development. This is people, you know, they get used to it. They, they're blown away with what they can do proxying traffic, but they soon run into the, the kind of what I like to say is the, um, you know, can I swap your deployment if you've swapped the swap deployment already? And it gets super confusing because you literally you swap one deployment and then traffic's coming to your laptop. If someone swaps out your swap deployment, I think it becomes inception, basically. Yeah, it gets a bit, bit deep and um, not a good look. So this is a common requirement um, that we're working on some cool stuff with this. Uh, as you do try and scale up to things like namespaces and, and extra clusters, like I mentioned with Engel and Volkers and, and Christian's talk, like that does cost more money because you're running more hardware in these things as well. So we'd like to address the multi-user dev thing in a different way. Um, what, it would, what sort of one uh, idea pushing around, more as we talked about it, is you'd actually deploy a proxy in front or beside, maybe as a sidecar. Everyone loves a good sidecar yeah, these days. Put a sidecar next to your um, app, and the traffic is being routed to my local laptop via that proxy. 
I'm not swapping out the deployment, I'm adding an extra sidecar, it's intelligently routing traffic to my laptop or not. And the cool thing with this kind of stuff is once you put that proxy in and you're making requests, if you add a cookie or some kind of header value, Daniel's accessing this service, you can propagate, propagate sorry, the cookie down and intelligently route the traffic. So I'm only routing traffic that I'm interested in. Yeah? So as long as the ingress can propagate the cookie down, I can basically say, my traffic, route to my local laptop, I can debug. Other traffic, let it go through to the actual deployment service still running in that cluster. So that's something, stay tuned on that stuff. Wrapping up, and then a bit of time for questions. It is an open source tool. We, we really appreciate contributions, yeah? And contributions don't have to be code. Documentation, workflows, website stuff. There is a bunch of um, uh, things there. Some low hanging fruit in the GitHub repo. Abe is super um, helpful with these things as well. We can always find a bunch of us on the DataWire Slack. We've got an open source Slack. We can chat about um, Telepresence and Ambassador and a bunch of other tools as well. We'd love you to get involved. Really appreciate that. Um, we do have a booth downstairs, S46. Come and chat to us um, if you want to know more. Our Abe session will go into much more detail this afternoon around the debugging. And he's got, I think, yeah, Python. Java and Go. Uh, it is 520 in room 30 A, B, C, D, E. All the letters there, which is good. Um, you can find more information at www.telepresence.io, GitHub. You can um, tweet us at telepresence.io as well. My Twitter handle and email's there if you do want to reach out. At that point, we'll, I'll say thanks a lot. Uh, I appreciate it. it is lunchtime, so I'll say thanks now. But any questions you've got, feel free to fire them away or come and find myself and Rafi afterwards. Thanks for your time. No, we've got to, yeah. Do you know? Why do you choose to use SSH instead of Well, that's definitely a question for Rafi. Why do we choose um, S Shuttle instead of things like IP encapsulation? Do you want to? Uh, no, sorry. Yeah, I might. Good question. Uh, well, the truth is, it worked, and it worked well <laughs> for us, uh, you know. Um, the, uh, one of the problems with using sort of more traditional VPN things is uh, we find users want to be able to use telepresence uh, to connect to their cluster while they're on a VPN and, you know, multiple VPNs don't always like playing together. Uh, so that's one of the reasons we're, we're looking at sort of a more lighter weight, uh, non-VPN based uh, proxying solution. What's that? You guys don't support, if I need to be on VPN, you don't support. So the question is, do we, if you're already using a VPN, say, to connect to your corporate network, and you want to use telepresence again? Yeah. Uh, your mileage may vary. Uh, we've yeah. <laughs> yeah, it literally is that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so sometimes it depends on the VPN, but sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. New work is coming in this kind of space. And it, again, open source projects, so we're always looking for pull requests and these kind of things. Yeah. Uh, so. so. Does telepresence work when I use a service mesh in my cluster that redirects traffic anyway? So the question is, does telepresence work when I use a service mesh in the cluster? Yes, it does. How? <laughs> <laughs> um, because what we're, we're just replacing the application with a proxy, and so whatever traffic gets redirected, um, you know, we're, we're basically operating in a different layer. So. It gets interesting when I was mentioning about using a proxy in front of the application, like the, the multi-user I talked about, that does get more interesting, but that's a, that's a future work type question. Yeah. Yeah. So along those lines, if you're using, uh, so Istio, for example, and you use traffic shaping, is there a way to put two instances of a given service in the cluster so that one is proxied out to me, another stays in the cluster so that you know, Joe's traffic stays on the service in the cluster, my traffic comes through. So the question is, if you're using a service mesh like Istio, you can do multiple deployments and then route traffic, shape traffic accordingly, 1% of traffic or your traffic to one service, the rest of the traffic to the other service, and only swap out your service. That's a really interesting question. I've not done that, but I, I think that's totally viable. I believe, uh, I, I'm, I believe some, I know of a couple, I know of at least one case where uh, people are using telepresence with Istio like that. Um, I know the one. Yeah, I know that one as well. Yeah. Uh, so yes, that 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 is possible. And you know, yeah. In the use cases we have uh, an application stack with you know a hundred plus microservices, a half a dozen or more pets, 
and it'd be nice if a group of developers could all use the same cluster, but each work on their own microservice, whether those are different microservices mm -hmm. or the same microservice, and only their traffic, so they log into the system. Yeah, so yeah. I can just use route traffic of my login back to my system. Yep. And the other guys can do the same, and we can still share the common parts. Yes, and yes. We'll only have to administer one Kubernetes cluster with the entire stack. So yeah. that's exactly the that's exactly what we want to enable uh, with with sort of the multi-user story per request routing, uh, but enable it in a way that requires sort of less assembly. Some um, and, folks, and, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. And, and and will work whether or not you're using SDM. Yeah, that's what I was going. Some folks don't want to run a service mesh for various reasons or can't run a service mesh, so we're trying to cater for both use cases there. Yeah. We do basically that. Yeah, and we're, we're working on making that integration sort of uh, more first class out of the box, uh, sort of have yeah. it just work. Very quick summary for the video. Yeah, it's just using Ambassador to, uh, or Ingress to sort of pass down headers and so forth. And perhaps I can blog a little bit more about that, just for folks who yeah, yeah. didn't quite catch that audio on the recording, I can write some more stuff and share that. How does it compare with Derek and Draft? Sorry, could you? How does it compare with Derek and Draft? How does it compare with? Um, Oh, tilt and draft. Oh, so, oh sorry, tilt and draft. Um, so I, I almost think they're different tools. Um, there's a fantastic presentation by Ellen Corbs, who works for Tilt now, I believe, and they go into much more detail. So if you get uh, Google Ellen Corbs, um, she's done. A, they've done a fantastic presentation on this kind of thing. Um, those tools are more geared towards automating the build and the deploy behind the scenes. Telepresence is focusing on swapping the traffic. That makes sense. And I mean, it's really like a scaffold draft. They're all subtly different. That's why I'm happy to chat to you afterwards. It is definitely a deeper, a deeper question. But and I think you can use a combination of the tools. Nothing is stopping you doing that. It's always worth recognizing your use case. Do you want that fast loop with telepresence forwarding traffic, or do you just want to minimize some of the pain of the build and deploy in the background? Choose your tools appropriately for that. Um, but Ellen Corb's fantastic presentation. Uh, they've talked about telepresence, draft, scaffold, a bunch of other ones too. So I learned a lot from Ellen. Yeah. I mean, at a high level, you can think of it as those, those tools, draft and scaffold, are shipping your code to the cluster and building it there. Whereas with telepresence, you're actually building it with your local tools. Uh, so you can use all the same local tools, IDE, the de you know, debuggers, all those tools. You can use the same as if you were just hacking on a, a monolith locally. One final question, and we better wrap up. That's right with time. So you had your hand up. When I start up telepresence, is it routing all of my traffic? Like if I open up Chrome and go to Google.com, is that going to go through as well? So the question is, um, when you start up telepresence, is it hijacking all your traffic, <laughs> for example? And if you were to type in www.google, is that going to go to the cluster and out? Yes. So. Uh, it depends on, uh, you, you, you can choose. Uh, um, it depends on if you're running inside of a container in container mode, it will capture everything in the container. Um, if you're running outside of the container, it will not. So your browser. Um, I, I believe we might actually intercept DNS uh, through the cluster by default, uh, but the actual network traffic won't, won't go through the cluster. So yeah, yeah I so. didn't talk about that too much, but telepresence does have a bunch of different modes. Um, Ave will probably go into maybe get that in this afternoon. We can always have a chat offline about that. Depending on what mode you're running, different things happen. Yep. And it has been talked about a lot in the telepresence Slack. So well worth jumping onto the Slack and having a search there. It's a, it's a good question. It's a common question that pops yeah, up. Yeah, and one of, the, uh, one of the things we're moving to um, is uh, you know, with, with sort of our replacement for S-Shuttle, um, is because we're intercepting DNS, uh, sort of using DNS as a discovery source. We have a lot more control over that. Um, so you can have a lot more flexibility about what you want to go into the cluster and what you want to sort of behave as it would normally. Um, cool. We better wrap, we're over time, uh, apologies. We'll be around for a few minutes now and we'll be down in the booth later on, so feel free to come and have a chat to us now. Thanks a lot.